Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, thank you again, of course, to Stuart for, uh, for this idea and continuing the initiative, and thank you very much. So we're going to speak tonight um, about the vidui. Uh, vidui, for lack of a better translation, will translate as confession of one's sins. It obviously takes an extremely, oops, thank you. It obviously, we're speaking again about vidui on Yom Kippur. It obviously takes an extremely significant part of the Yom Kippur davening. Forgive me, I'm a little bit torn. If we go through word by word, um, then I'll probably have to do chuba on Yom Kippur for either holding you too long or boring you or both. So what I would like to do is I would like to speak about some ideas connected to the Um I would like to share some specific uh, interpretations of some specific phrases and terms within the Vidui that I personally found very moving and at least possibly more than meets the eye in terms of the terms, just give people a little bit more to think about. So we'll kind of cobble things together, hopefully it'll be a meaningful, uh, meaningful gathering. Um, first of all, it's worthwhile to note that the whole concept of Vidui is a puzzle from the Torah. Just the, it says in the Torah, it's actually in the aftermath of the Tokacha, or actually in the midst of, of one of the sections of rebuke, that when Klal Yisrael was being taught, you know, all the terrible things that could happen, it says in the Pasuk, Visvaduas Avonam, Visavon Avosam, Vimalam Hashem that they will confess their sins and the sins of their fathers and in that which they wronged me, me being God. So this concept of coming before God and expressing our sins goes back explicitly to the Torah. It's one interesting thing to think about. Um, another puzzle, which is not from the Torah, but it's from the Navi, but it's very frequently quoted and it's powerful to think about. Take with you words, and repent to God. And this is actually, we'll get into this a little bit later, God willing, in terms of some of the technical halachas that we do, but this is actually a very important puzzle because we learn that the confession has to be enunciated. In other words, take with you words. You can't fully repent to God without the usage of words. That's what we learn from that verse, that we have to say it. And it's interesting, people, people frequently um, remark, like, what difference does it make? What difference does it make if I say it or if I think it? I mean, God knows what I'm thinking, right? So, so if, if I organize the thoughts in my mind, but the truth is, yes, yes, um, I don't know if I'm an expert at repentance, but I'm an expert at doing things wrong. As, uh, as someone who has had the experience of, of at, least, at least doing the video on some things that I do wrong, or I don't know if anyone else has had the same experience, it actually is a powerful moment to actually say explicitly, I'm going to get into this a little bit later, appropriate video is to explicitly say what I did wrong. So just, just, just to give an example, there's an al referring to Lashon Hara speaking ill of others. Hey, so, so the truth is, you know, we read that and we say, yeah, God, you know, I'm sure I said a lot of Lashon Hara, and I feel bad for all of it. And we said it. Truth be told, if there's a specific example that pops into our minds, or if there's a specific individual of how whom we're in the habit of, of speaking ill of, or a specific group of individuals, whatever it is, it's halakhically appropriate to stop at that moment and enunciate it all. And not necessarily talk about the bad things that you said, but uh, you know, but uh, but to enunciate it all, and to say, you know, the thing that I said, that email that I wrote about that person, was terrible. And, and you know what? Even if you bring it up in your mind, it is more powerful to actually think about, it, to actually say it. Excuse me. I, I found it in my own experience. I, I would guess I'm not the only one here who's found that to be the case. So it's a very interesting thing. I'm learning from the pasuk. Take with you words. Ruth Dessler has a, a beautiful thought. Uh, by the way, uh, someone commented to me the other day, absolutely correctly, sometimes we're guilty of just throwing these names around left and right. People have no idea what we're talking about. <coughs> Revelio Dessler uh, lived uh, quite recently. Uh, I think he passed away, I guess around 40, 50 years ago, something in that ballpark. Uh, he uh, was most famous. For he was a, a, a rabbinic figure, um, most prominently in England, and he was most famous for writing the, the set of books 
Mikhtab uh, Meliyahu, and the English is Strive for Truth. Very, very powerful set of words. Rav Dessler writes, but this is not the literal meaning of the Pasuk, but something to think about in the Pasuk. Take with you the words, meaning, take the words that you say to God and, and take it along with you. Let, it, let the words become a part of you. Let the words that you say to God impact you. And that doesn't necessarily only regard the specific sins for which I'm apologizing, but uh, this is actually something we spoke about last week in the context of Rosh Hashanah too. There's so many powerful things that we say to go through a whole Yom Kippur and say all this and not at least slightly tweak our own outlook and our own attitude would be a tragedy. So make yourself a different person through the words. God's a different story. He's listening also. But take the words with yourself. It's an interesting way to think about things. Um, general comments about Vidui. We say Vidui a number of times over the Yom Kippur um, I, I, I believe the grand tale is ten. I, I, I think so. Starting from the prayer of Yom Kippur. Um, we say Vidui in the private Shmona Esrei. We say Vidui in the, the Chazan's repetition. Besides the Kippur, we say, we say Vidui in the Chazan's repetition. And um, it's actually a very interesting thing to think about. Why is Vidui part of Shmona Esrei in the first place? Why should that be? We dive a number of times to God in Yom Kippur. That's one section. Uh, for example, although Nusaf Sfar does blow shofar during Rosh Hashanah Nusaf, uh, the vast majority of us aren't going to blow shofar during Shmona Esrei. The core of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah is separate from Shmona Esrei. It's part, of, it's part of the service of Rosh Hashanah. So it should be like, I don't know, like in between Shachos and Musaf, let's stop to say Vidui. After Musaf, we'll say Vidui. That's not how we do it. We say it as part of Shmona Esrei, and we say it as part of the Chazan's repetition. It, it, it's, it's somewhat bizarre that that's the role that Vidui has in its Vila. And by the way, it really seems like we're just trying to stick it in because unlike in the Chazan's repetition in our private Shmona Esrei, we just say it all the way at the end. Unlike we spoke last week about Malfios and Kronos and Shofros and Rosh Hashanah Musaf, and that's part and parcel of this one Esrei. This we just like, okay, before you take three steps back, just take another ten pages for the Vidui. So clearly the rabbis didn't think it was core to one of the blessings of Shmona Esrei because it's not in, at least not in our private Shmona Esrei. It just stuck there at the end. So if it just stuck there at the end, why is it part of Shmona Esrei at all? Interesting question. And Rav Shimshon Pincus, even more recent than Rav Dessler, was, was a rabbinic figure in Israel, passed away in a tragic accident, something like five years ago, ten years ago, something like that. But also, again, we quoted him last week too. It's beautiful writing, it's beautiful thoughts. He says that what you see from that is Vidui is not a, he doesn't use this terminology, but Vidui is not an outpatient program. Vidui is not, I come in, I, I have sins, I confess my sins, I feel bad about my sins, and I move on. It's actually not what Vidui is. It's not what appropriate Vidui is. Vidui is a part of Tshuva. It's a part of repentance. What does Tshuva mean? I really translated it poorly just now. We call Tshuva repentance. That's not what the word Tshuva means. Tshuva means return. Right? That's what Tshuva means. We, we, we say, in the Pasuk of Dathur, Shabbos Shuba, Shuba Yisrael, Ad Hashem it's the same root as Shuba, return Israel to Hashem your God. So, Vidui is part of a Shuba process. And, and that the, the point is that I see myself as having acted inappropriately in the dynamic of my relationship with God. And and, and therefore, I specify the ways in which I've acted inappropriately because I have tainted our relationship. That's what it is about. Again, if a person just says that broadly and doesn't specify and doesn't think about the specific sins, it hasn't been a meaningful meaning. Just like if you imagine, if you have a friend or a relative, whatever it is, who, who wronged you, let's say there was a period of, of, uh, of uh, tension, Okay, I just have to, Ima, I was talking about if there's tension within a family, this was not at all a considered, <laughs> but um, let's, say, let's say there's a period of, uh, of tension, and then finally someone feels bad about it, and they go to their loved one, 
and they come and they give a host that you know that means so much to me. I feel so bad about how I treated you inappropriately and, and I want to have a meaningful relationship with you. And they never talk about what they did wrong. I, I think most of us would feel like, so what did you say to me already? Like, you didn't even really apologize. And yet, if they only apologize, imagine two people that are close to each other and uh, one of them really wrong the other person. So he decides to calls up his lawyer. Nothing, no offense to any of the lawyers in the room. He calls up his lawyer and says, okay, I would like you to help me write up a statement of apology that, that hits all the points with, without, you know, inappropriately, uh, you know, without inappropriately pointing the finger of blame myself any more than I have to. It was a very formal letter and he sends it to his loved one. That's not going to go over very well either. The answer is you need both. And, and that's why Suggest with Pincus, Vidui is part of Shona Esrael. Because it's really about the relationship with God, which of course, and it's of course, what Shona Esrael is all about. So this is an aspect of, maybe we'll pause for comments in a few moments if you want. This is an aspect of trying to strengthen our relationship with God, and that's really what Yom Kippur is about, and that's really what Shuvah is about. Just an interesting way of thinking about it in that light. Um, How would you feel? You know, if you don't mind just waiting and drop it, thank you. Um, just to think about for a moment that Pasuk that we cited before take with you words and return to God I think what Pincus quotes the Pasuk it's kind of the same point the purpose of the video is to bring ourselves closer to God uh, another interesting thing to think about it's actually from this week's Parsha uh, if, if you look in the Parsha there's a whole formula that the person is supposed to say after a certain number of years, during the completion of the Maaser period. After, I believe it's after three years, uh, there's, there's, there's a certain formula explicitly laid out in the Torah that a person's supposed to say, kind of, when he comes to the base of Mikdash, and he says, I've, I've, I've kept the laws of Maaser, all the different types of tithing, I've kept it appropriately. That halachically is referred to as Vidui Masros. Vidui is the same word. It says explicitly in the Pasuk, the person says, I didn't do anything wrong, I did it all right. And yet we refer to it as Vidu. So essentially what we think it suggests is Vidu is about coming to terms with God. That's what it really is about. If I may just share one more thought and then I'm going to have to open the floor for questions. Um, I had an interesting experience once. There was um, one of the uh, members of our community who's a very devoted member of the Dafyomi. I, I believe he's finished Shas twice now. And uh, he does not have a, a particular learning background. And um, I, I always marvel at, at people like that who are able to make that kind of, have that kind of dedication and have that type of achievement, particularly in the context of Gemara, which is such a technical study, uh, very unique, you know? So um, somehow I got the guts once to ask him. I was talking to him in a setting. I essentially asked him, what in the world got you into the Daf Yomi in the first place? And what I, what I hopefully asked a little bit um, appropriately and not rudely was, essentially, how in the world did you think you were going to do this? And he said to me something so interesting. He said, you know, I, I, on my own skill base, you know, experience base, I, I, I felt I had no hope. But I had a very good friend who was very involved in Daf Yomi, very good personal friend who was far stronger than I was in that, you know, in, in, in that genre of study. And I knew that he would not let me fail. It's a fascinating, just, just take that as a drop of muscle for the true experience. In other words, most of the time we come, and, and we come to God, and it's sort of like, I'm over here, and God's over there. Essentially, we're sitting on two sides of the table. We imagine God as the judge. And we come and we submit our brief. I say, okay, I know, you know, we, we plead guilty in this regard, that regard, in that regard, but we think we're going to do better this year. And please accept it. But what he's really suggesting, it's really a very different model. He suggests that we turn to God as, as our Father, also our King, but our Father, and, and we beseech Him to look at us with mercy, and we come to Him with sincerity, and we come to Him with affection, and we ask Him to help us. We ask Him to look at us in a certain way. It's sort of like, so he suggests that the reason why the vast majority of us who very sincerely doubt on Yom Kippur, 
that we want to be better in this regard, we want to be better in that regard. And it's very blunt. The vast majority of us, the vast majority of the time, find ourselves the next Yom Kippur wanting to be better in the same regard. He suggests, again, far easier said than done even after you take what he says. He suggests that the problem is that we don't see it enough on a relationship level. And we see it on a, on a uh, you know, I'm just going to be better. Well, if you sin once, it's hard not to sin again. But if, if the whole Shuba experience is a deepening of the connection to God, it's a different relationship. Just an interesting thing to think about. Um, Mrs. Lerner, do you, you, you want to say something? Mm-hmm. Yes. Great. Thank you. So what is it? Yeah, I just wanted to rephrase your earlier question. Uh, if you were the agreed party, how would you feel about the uh, person coming before you reading from a prepared text of dozens of, of uh, offenses that had nothing to do with your relationship and had been prepared for millions of people to read over and over again? Yes, I think that's a very, a very good. I, I, I would be very moved and touched. You wouldn't? No. Uh, uh, I think, I think Just that's... Just for that, no. What? Just for that, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I think that's a good point. Um, uh, let me counter with, with, with another muscle, if I may. Um, let's say you had a young child who came to his parents and I, I guess this is probably a terrible example because it's probably way too heavy. So all the, 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 the child devices in the room, please forgive me, but theoretically speaking, uh, and realized that he did something wrong and he can't find the words for it. He can't express it. He doesn't have the emotional, he does have the emotional depth to feel it, but he doesn't have the sophistication to put it to words. And he comes and he comes to the parents and says, I'm sorry, but but the parent senses that, but it's not at some level it's not enough. And so imagine if the parent or the educator, whoever it is, uh, and, and you see this by the way in uh, something not so different from this in, in nursery school classrooms. At least probably in older grades also. But I visit the nursery school, so I see it. They have these charts of emotional charts, not not for this, but as you know, uh, how do you feel? They like point to the thing. You know, I feel happy. I feel sad. I feel, and and truth be told, if they couldn't point to the specific thing. They probably couldn't put their finger on it, but yet when they have the things in front of them, they can. So imagine this child doesn't know how to express what they did wrong, and they're given a chart, and they take the time to go through the whole chart. Now, if they go through the whole chart and it's all just by rote, then, uh, you know. But imagine if they finally hit on one and say, yeah, that one. I think that would be very, uh... And so I, I, think, I think the point is very well taken, but I, I, I think we're supposed to view this as a guide a little bit to help us um, find our points. I think that's how we should do it, and I hope that's a, I hope that's a guy who's doing so. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Yes? Another thought on that might be that uh, hopefully we're not guilty of all the things that are delineated <laughs> in, in the monster, uh, but we say them in the plural as part of the community, and that maybe somebody is, is yes. guilty right. of so, I'm, But when we approach the ones that seem to hit home more, maybe it's more appropriate to pause further and, and thank you. Thank here's, you. Here's your example of the specifics. Right. I, so I think that's one point. I want to I digress on that if I may, because I think it's a very good point. Um, there's some, I, 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 I believe I once saw, and I'm just blanking on the context which I saw it, but I believe I once saw that part of the idea of Vidui in the prime of Shmon Esri, and Vidui also in the Chazan's repetition, that's fascinating, that part of one Vidui, basically half the Vidui, as I say, just between me and God, and that's it. And half the Vidu, as we say in a very public way, is, is because we both relate to God on, on, on our personal level. What I did wrong, we relate to God as a community. And that, that's very much in what, in what you're talking about. Uh, thank you. Uh, another thing that, that I've seen written before that's always moves me, um, and again, forgive me, I, I don't remember the source. Another thing for which we say Vidu is perhaps I never committed sin X, Y, or Z. Maybe A, maybe you know A through V, but I, I didn't do X, Y, and Z. But perhaps I, whether I did something to someone that indirectly caused them to commit sin X, Y, or Z, or maybe I didn't appropriately reach out to someone, and if I had, maybe they wouldn't have committed sin X, Y, or Z. 
that on some level I have a responsibility for them too. It's an interesting way to think about the sins that we look at, and there are many. I mean, the sins that we look at in the freedom zone, it's nothing to do with me. You know, and it's just an, interest, an interesting thing to think about. And finally, I, I appreciate your point very much. Um, I, 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 that's personally, um, I, I, I very much try to do that during the silent Shemona Esrei. Um, when, I, when I'm on my game, which is at this point most of the years not, but there were times over the years that I would sit down there with Yom Kippur, the days before Yom Kippur, and I would pull out a commentary on the Bidu. By the way, back there in school, Mom, sir, it's a beautiful commentary on the Bidu. Go to the bookstore or, or online, there are numerous very powerful commentaries on the Bidu. It's very frustrating when you look at a literal translation of the Bidu because a lot of it seems like it's saying the same thing with 10 different words, and half of them look like they have nothing to do with me anyway. And, 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 but if you look at commentaries, again, if, if you look at, at the Vidui as a way to kind of jog our thoughts and, and get us thinking different ways, so I, there are many years where I've sat down before Yom Kippur with a piece of paper, and, and, and I found something relevant to write that I feel I need to be confessing for, um, for practically every one of them. Again, maybe not in the literal meaning, but let's say based on the, 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 the commentary, um, I find it extremely meaningful to do an exercise like that before Yom Kippur. Um, the other thing that I find is, is I find whether years that I get around doing that, whether years that I don't get around doing that, I find that as the day of Yom Kippur progresses, I find myself coming up with new things. Not that I did that day, just to clarify, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I find myself coming up with new things that you know, it's like once you begin to go to, see if I could just ask you to greet people once we're finished, okay? If you don't mind, thank you so much. So uh, I, I think the more we really think about it in, in a sincere way, the more it gets us, gets those, those thoughts going. I'll say something else, it's a little scary, but this is how it's brought down in halacha. It's appropriate um, in the Vidui of Yom Kippur to also enunciate sins that we committed in the past years. Now, the bottom line is, vast majority of whatever sins we have, unfortunately, are not that memorable. And unfortunately, we probably have many examples from this year of, of, of sin X, Y, or Z. That just happens to be the reality. But every now and then, you know, there's something that we did that was just really bad. Really, that we said something that was just terrible. And to this day, we can't figure out how we could have said such a thing. It was might have been five years ago. It's still appropriate to mention that, you know, which, by the way, is an interesting thing to think about if you see it as strengthening the relationship with God. Again, this is not legal briefs. This is, this is talking to God. So it's an interesting thing that's also cited in the context of the Bible. This is learning. story the other day. I'm going to cut to the chase. It's a very powerful story. I'm just going to set like, the outline of the story. Um, basically, there was a, a, an individual who was visiting someone's home. Uh, the host was extremely destitute, and, the, and they were so poor that they could only afford one cup of coffee per day. 
and uh, sorry, just imagine me trying to, you know, they can only afford one, one, cup, one cup of coffee per day. And um, it was very obvious that the husband would always make a cup of coffee for the wife, and that was the coffee for the day. It was just very evident to the guests who was there for a few days that the husband, I guess, in that, in that neighborhood, in that community, coffee was a basic, basic thing that he had. This person absolutely forgot it. So on the one hand, it was extremely beautiful, but it seemed a little bit over the top in the sense that, like, maybe give her the coffee 75% of the time, you know what I mean? I mean, like, but like, you never, you never get coffee, you know, she always gets the coffee, it's like a little bit. So the guest asked the host about it, and, and just to cut to the chase, the host explained that he had acted in an insensitive way, in a terribly insensitive way to his wife, decades before when they were first getting married. And it always bothered him how he could act that way. And every day he gives her a cup of coffee because that's, that's his way of, of reminding himself yet again how his wife always has to. So again, that, that kind of story can be taken to, to very unhealthy extremes. But m maybe just as a drop of mushroom to the extent that we have this affectionate relationship with God and the topic comes up of, of ways that I've wronged you I have moved forward, and I feel I have a deeper relationship with you than I did before. But once the topic, I, I can't act like I never did that. Maybe I don't know. I, I I don't know. I'll be very honest with you. If it wasn't in that lacha, I, I would not assume that we would do it this way. To be very candid with you, this is maybe a respect, but I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. Um, just before we go on, kind of back to more meaning type ideas, uh, just to talk a little bit about some of the halachas that we do it. Again, we certainly mentioned already that it makes sense to specify sins that a person has committed, um, and not just think about it, but specify it. It is perfectly fine to do so in English. It is perfectly fine, in other words, uh, um, traditionally we say, I mean, in general, in Shemona Esrei, it's fine. If a person can't do it in Hebrew, they can do it in English. But even if a person, let's say, feels comfortable diving in Hebrew and glancing over at the English for translation, it could be that they're not comfortable um, specifying sins in Hebrew. That's a complicated thing to do. So if a person is more comfortable doing it in English, if it'll be easier for a person to do it in English, you know, and less, less uh, tripping over themselves. Uh, absolutely appropriate. Absolutely appropriate and fine. Um, uh, just halacha, again, if we can't, we can't. We're supposed to be standing during what we're doing. Um, we're not supposed to be leaning on things. Now, if a person needs a little bit of support, it's like if you imagine the way I'm standing right now, I'm standing and I'm, I'm just, you know, leaning a little bit against the thing. If I'm standing like this, then I'm really leaning on this thing. Theoretical barometer is a thing with move away when I fall. Uh, but, but so, so if a person wants to bend over a little bit on, on the pew or seat in front, of him, in front of him or her, that's fine. But really, if at all possible, a person shouldn't be leaning. If a person can't say be who's standing, a person can't, you know, if they need to lean, they need to lean. But if at all possible, a person is supposed to be standing without completely relying on something. Um, by the way, I think, though a bit tedious, actually I think that body language and sometimes even a little bit of exhaustion, again, a person shouldn't push themselves to the limits of health, but a little bit of exhaustion, is actually, I think, creates a little bit of a stronger feeling in what we're talking about, honestly. Um, we know that for each shamnu, I think, you know, we, we, we strike our chest over the heart. Um, contrary to popular opinion, there's no mitzvah to strike hard, but, but, but the point is that, that it's a physical act to show how much it disturbs us. Um, yeah, and then those are just some general halachos about about Hebrew. Okay. Um, any other comments before we go kind of back? Yeah, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. An oversight. Thank you. It's also in general you don't give that but particularly during Bidu, a person is supposed to be somewhat uh, bent over. It's it's a it's a position of, of a physical position of humbling oneself before God. So that's such a concept. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So, is it preferred to try to do it in Hebrew? I would, if a person normally feels comfortable um, dabbing, you know, in the Hebrew, you know, consider mass or whatever it is, I, I would encourage a person to do it in Hebrew. There's no rush in Bidui. I mean, you know, the concert petition is very long. You, you, you know what I mean? Uh, I wouldn't worry about inserting the things during the public, uh, you know, recital of Bidui, but the private recital of Bidui. Um, um, uh, I, I would encourage, if a person feels comfortable doing so, I would encourage to do it in the Hebrew. That seems to be the more 
But I meant more the additional things that one mentions. I think it's really fine to do it in English. And if a person's not comfortable doing it, they'd be doing Hebrew, they could do the whole thing in English. But that's what I think it's better to do in Hebrew, but if a person's comfortable doing it. So. You referred to the speed, so to say, of saying it. Um, should one not worry about uh, being finished to participate in the Kedusha or? So that's a wonderful, a wonderful question. Thank you. Truth be told, uh, it actually is pursuant to what we talked about before, that Bidu is just kind of tucked into the end of Shemar Esrei. Uh, if a person is going to say a long Bidui, it makes sense to say the line, I think they have the most Mazorim, before the Bidui begins, which is like a husk of closure of the world of the Tefillah. And that allows one, that if, and even if one forgot, they can still do it. If they're in Kedusha, a person can answer uh, at least something of Kedusha. You know, the Kadosh, 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 the Brook, but a person can answer it in the middle of the Bidui app also. So there really is very little um, motivation to, uh, to, to finish by a, I mean, you know, we're all gonna be there for a while anyway. So if a person is finding the experience to be uh, meaningful and they feel they're actually getting somewhere in terms of their own emotional uh, uh, speaking to God, uh, I see no rush, like no rush at all. Gosh, even if you tell me they'll miss the communal bidui, they're saying a meaningful bidui, Yeah, even if you forget to say Yeratzon, you, you still have the option. But don't take three steps back yet. But right. you know, but at the very end of the video, you take you know at the you know the old special like, Don't say don't step back. Like, don't step back. But if, if you're in the middle of video when they get to the shot, you answer the the psukim of kadosh kadosh kadosh, the pasuk of kadosh kadosh, and all the stuff in between. But, right. but uh, right. and the truth is, if the chazan gets into the tune of whatever it is, uh, you can continue with the video in between, in between the verses. Let me also, forgive me for being so technical, I just think sometimes we wonder about this stuff and it's not so clear. Um, if a person wants to just sort of like stand for a moment straight, like in between the sections of the video, or even in between lines of the video, honestly, they just need to break a little bit, that's fine too. Again, if a person's not medically able to stand that way, they shouldn't, but many of us are able to, but it's still just very strenuous and we find ourselves distracted by the strain. If a person wants to pause for a moment, just stand up straight, just take a break for a moment, you know, and then, you know, bend again, that's fine. But as we're saying, the video, if it all possible, it was not over in strike images. Okay. Um, famously, the video is in the uh, olive phase format. It's alphabetical. Um, the most basic explanation as to why the video is alphabetical is it's essentially we've run through God from A to Z, you know, and everything in between, and it, it's kind of an all encompassing type of thing. Um, it, by the way, does create, if you look at the Vidui as a list of springboard topics, uh, it creates a little bit of a baseline, even for the composer of the Vidui, a little bit. If not, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be like, it's never ending list, like, what, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of an outline almost, you, you know, not, a, not, a, not an outline of content, but an outline of just something to, to, to cling to a little bit. Uh, Rav Dessler has a fascinating thought. Uh, there's a halacha, the idea of heaven forbid a person is present, uh, sorry, if a person is present when another passes away, heaven forbid, uh, a person is supposed to tear a A person is supposed to tear their clothing, even if they're not a uh, close relative. Uh, if they're present in the room, when another passes away, they're supposed to tear a And the Gemara, when the Gemara explains this, um, this law, the Gemara compares it to if a person is present when a sacred Torah is burned. That there's a concept, heaven forbid, if a person's present to say that there is burnt, of tearing Kriya as a sign of, of mourning. And so the Gemara says that every person, every soul of Israel is comparable. Uh, you know, this is Allah, if, if one is present when a Jewish soul passes away, every Jewish soul is comparable to a sacred Torah. Every human soul is, is, has, has a likeness of God within it, but uniquely every Jewish soul is comparable to a sacred Torah. So Rav Desla borrows from that concept and he says, if every Jewish soul is comparable to a sacred Torah, then we each have our own letters. And in the same way that every letter within a sacred Torah holds sanctity, so figuratively speaking, the letters of our soul, many of them have been defamed in different ways. 
And we, through our sins, have made our own Sifrei Torah puzzle to a certain extent. And therefore, he says, that's the idea of going through the Vidui Aleph through Tuf. As such, that we're touching every letter of the alphabet. Just an interesting way to think about things. Interesting thought. Okay. Um, what I would like what I would like to do now is, again, this is so, I'm sure some things I should comment on, other things I shouldn't comment on. I, I, I just went through quickly um, some examples of what I find to be very meaningful thoughts within the Vidui, uh, the definition of what's a, what's a meaningful thought from the Vidui is something that moves me. Uh, so we're all different, of course. Um, but it happens to be yeah, I, I highlighted a number of, of, of thoughts and commentaries that speak more about the nature of our relationship with God. Not all the ones that I mentioned are, are that way, but just some things to think about. Um, maybe one of these will hit you in some way, maybe not. Uh, if, if, if any of these comments begin to hit you in a way, I would again strongly urge you to get yourself either an art school box, or I'm sure some of the other box are have commentaries on video at this point, but just even I'd be doing pamphlets around. I see, Ruth, if you don't mind, just lifting your feet for a moment. That's an old, famous one that so many people have used over the years. Uh, people find it very meaningful. So many books out there. But, but it, it, it can be so much more meaningful than, than, we, uh, than, than, than the, the, the literal translation. Um, okay, I happen to be, if you happen to have an art school master, it's page 92. I'm, I'm right at the beginning of the Vidui. Elokeinu Elokeinu saying. So, our God and the God of our fathers, may our prayers come before you. And literally translated, do not allow yourself to disappear, to turn away from our from our pleas. You know, what do you mean? Are you trying to find that God doesn't listen to prayer? If you tell me, God, please answer my prayer, but tisalam means like, don't ignore me. I, I, does the speaker believe in prayer? Does he not believe in prayer? It's an interesting thought. So all the comments, I, almost all the comments I'm going to make now are from Ruth Dessler. He has a running commentary. So he says an interesting thing. He says, many times we're guilty of ignoring our own shortcomings. Right? You know, I'm perfect. I'm wonderful. Or on the other hand, I am what I am. If, if I ever do anything wrong, it's not my fault. It's because that's how God made me. It's my personality. But it's not my fault. So, if we are guilty of ignoring our own flaws and, and not looking at ourselves honestly, essentially, we're ignoring God. In other words, because if, if God puts me in this world to do good things and to better myself. So if I refuse to ever look at myself in earnest, what am I saying? What am I saying about why God put me here in the first place? So I beg you to look at me as someone who's looking at him or herself in earnest. I'm not ignoring my own issues. I'm not ignoring myself. And in the merit of my looking honestly at myself, I ask you to turn the focus towards my prayers. Not implying that God doesn't listen to prayers, but rather implying that if I am not honest with myself in any way, shape, or form, what right do I have to ask God to pay any attention to me? Because if I'm not honest with myself, I'm essentially ignoring him. It's an interesting shot. Um, skipping ahead um, to I'm just going to mention two here that I always find very meaningful. Ashamnu, you know, skipping the next paragraph, you know, the famous beginning of the, the Vidu's, the confessions. Ashamnu. Ashamnu is literally translated as we become guilty. Okay, this is I know, exhibit 1A on, on, on the example. If you just take the words literally, there are like 25 words that just mean the same thing. I was saying the same thing again and again. So I think it's from Rabdesh, so I don't remember where I saw this. Um, he connects the word Ashamnu to Shmama. The, the root of Hashem was Aleph Shin Mem, to be guilty. Shmama is a different root, in all honesty. It's a related root. It's Shin Mem Mem. 
Shamay or Shmama means barren, desolate. I turned to God and I recognized the fact that you imbued me with this sacred soul. And I have taken the fertile land of the soul that you gave me and I've made it barren. And I've taken such great potential and I've done so little. Again, this is, I, we, we should never be too heavy on ourselves, but Yom Kippur is a day that we roll up our sleeves a little bit, that we, we do look at ourselves a little struggling. So that's a very interesting shot in the word for Shammu. Very powerful way, it's, it's like the, the opening of Eden. It's very powerful to think about. Um, just another one that I always find meaningful. Because Alma. Because Alma is a classic example. We stole. And I don't think I stole from anyone this year. I don't think so. So, again, I think it's for Dessler. He says, you know, Gemara says that a person eats something without properly blessing God before it, it's like he's stealing from God. So Gemara says in a totally different context. So imagine thinking about that when I say the word we stole. God, you know, how many times did I benefit from your beautiful world without appropriately appreciating it? Without appropriately appreciating you? Just, just, just some examples to think about that there's so much more here than just a literal translation of the words. Okay. Um, in the art scroll, we'll, we'll, we'll turn the page. Again, we could talk so much more. I just want to highlight a few points. Um, very top of page 94, the beginning of the Alphabets. So, Alphabet Shechatan Tamecha, for the sin that we sin before you, the ones who brought some. Now, ones means it was beyond my control. Ones does not mean an accident. That, I think, is somewhere on the list. That's shkaga. Uh, that's, I, I didn't know the halacha. You know, gosh, I guess if I would have gone to more shiurim, you know, read my books better, you know, I don't know, I probably would have listened more. I probably would have known it. I made a mistake. I'm sorry about that. There's another outfit, the I didn't know. But on some level, it's probably my fault. You know, probably if I would have applied myself, but I would have known. Okay, okay. Ones means it was beyond my control. So what do I apologize to God for a sin about Ones? What does that even mean? So Ruth Dessler says that yeah, Ones means there are so many times in life that I look at myself and I say, how can I do this thing? It's the wrong thing to do. And I say, I have no choice. Now, sometimes we do have no choice. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it's not. Right? How many times we have this famous idea that God give, doesn't give us tests that we can't handle? So, the, the flip of that is that sometimes we find ourselves in situations and it's just simply beyond me. It's just simply beyond me. I can't, I can't. And, and I'm, no one's perfect and I'm not perfect and I hope God understands. Sometimes we have situations like that. Or we sometimes have situations where we think it's like that and it's really not. And that's the whole thing. Sometimes I wrote it off as it's, as it's, I just can't do it. And you know what? You could have done it. You just didn't try hard. It's an interesting shot of this. Now, Ratzon, Ratzon is sins that we committed against God with will, that we can probably understand a little bit better what it might mean. But uh, he has an interesting approach to that, too, which is that it's a statement of recognition. The, uh, the vast majority of times that I sin, the reason that I sin, it's because I had a certain will to do something that was inappropriate. Let's, let's just cut the chase. When I sin, the vast majority of the time that I sin, it's because of, of an inappropriate uh, prioritizing of things. And more better said, it's because I knew something was wrong and I just really wanted to do it. And maybe sometimes I convinced myself that it was right. But if I step away, I realize that it wasn't that I was wrong in my assessment of the situation was that I really wanted to do it. And that's a faith that I found that I could Well, okay. Um, okay, another interesting one. Uh, skipping one couplet. A faith that I found that I found the sin which we performed before you by Godly and by Sasser. I frequently am moved by this one. Um, Godly means sins that we committed publicly. By the way, on, on, on a very basic level, um, it's always bad if I sin. If I sin in front of people, there's something, in an aspect, there's something uniquely wrong about that because I actually, 
if you've never seen someone commit such and such a sin, you probably are less inclined to do it yourself. If, if, if you see someone commit a sin, you're, you're, you're you know, it's, it's, it's more within the zone of, of, of normal, you know? Uh, but Rav Dessel says something else for this. He suggests that perhaps what we're saying, the sins that I committed before you in the open are um, sometimes we do the wrong thing because we want people to view us in a certain way. Uh, uh, to me, the most stark example of this is we're sitting with someone, maybe it's a meeting, maybe it's a Shabbos table, we don't have anything intelligent to say. We want them to think of us as someone who has a vibrant conversation, etc. And we're, we're, we're grasping, we're grasping, and then we have an interesting criticism of someone, some institutions, this, that, and we decide, okay, so I'll, I'll have an incisive criticism of someone, and then I'll be smart, and then I'll be respected. It's a class, I mean, we do that all the time. It's just one example of that's the best way perspective on what it means to commit a sin in the open. Sometimes we commit sins because we're around people, because we want to be viewed in a certain way. Um, then, of course, this is a whole other story, by Galu uh, Yuvasaser, there are sins that we commit in private, there are certain things, that we only do because no one can see us. There are certain things that we do in the privacy of our own homes that we could never imagine doing when our neighbors would see. Maybe not our neighbors, maybe others. We could never imagine it. And, and so it's just like, it's always such a stark thing. So do I believe in God or do I not believe in God? Do I believe that God can see me or do I not? And yet, it's something that intellectually makes no sense if you're a believer, but you have to do it time. Um, okay, again, uh, skipping far ahead. Um, there's one I have in my notes, Mirma, but I'm finding it difficult. I don't know if anyone noticed it. Mirma. I'll just mention them. I'm sorry. I'm not. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Yeah, so it's like the fifth couplet or something. The sin that we commit before you, the das, with knowledge, presumably this means knowing that it was a sin. Mirma is treachery. Um, Mirma is treachery. So who did I... What is translated? The seeds? That would, yeah, the seeds is a much better word. Thank you. Um, um, so what does that mean, deceit? Uh, who am I deceiving? Uh, so maybe it means that I took advantage of someone. Maybe that's what it means. Did I trick someone? That could be. Um, what Desler says, many, many times, we're fooling ourselves. It's a way to think about mirror. So sometimes I know that I'm doing the wrong thing. Other times I convince myself that it's the right thing to do. Um, Another one, the ches one. The sin that we committed before you, literally translated with strength of hand. Um, one of the basic things I think about when I, I mean, it's something that we all, we all have positions of authority in one way or another. It could be within a family dynamic, it could be within a professional dynamic, it could be within a community dynamic. And many times we abuse that authority. Heaven forbid there are terrible stories, terrible scandals of abuse of authority. Hopefully we're not guilty of anything like that. But every now and then there's something that's not such a terrible scandal, but it's just wrong. You know, we pressure someone into agreeing with us because we know we can. We manipulate someone because we know we can. And officially they didn't, we gave them the option to say they don't want to. But, but, come on. So that, that's what I normally think about because of God, but I just want to share with strength of hand. Uh, Ruth Dessler says, there's a famous uh, phrase in Torah, sacred Tzvarim, that we sometimes are guilty of a sin of believing that that my strength and the might of my hand did this wondrous thing for me. Many times our whole outlook is skewed because we believe our success comes from ourselves and not from God's assistance. That in turn affects many things that we do and don't do. He suggested. So it's a sin about the attitude of the strength about. Um, another one, the next one. 
Chil Hashem. Uh, we we uh, talk a lot about Chil Hashem. Uh, it's a, a classic uh, standard model of any self-respecting day school to give the children a speech about Chil Hashem before any field trip, of course. Uh, that's appropriate. It's, it's, very, it's very important. When we're in place, probably we Jews, but we use observant Jews, Orthodox Jews. We, uh, we need to be careful about it. one impression we make on others. Um, but again, just, uh, just an interesting thought from Chesler, because, you know, maybe we made a Chil Hashem this year, maybe we didn't make a Chil Hashem this year. You know, hopefully we didn't. Uh, and just, by the way, on that level, we never know, we never know how people view us when we walk down the street. Um, we just never know, our neighbors, you know. And again, uh, you know, look, like, thank God, neighbor, like, I know there's so, there's so many of, forgive my language, there's so many of us and there's so few of them that things, you know, when we walk by, we walk by each other many times without greeting each other. We don't think anything of it. You have to understand, when we walk by a non-Jew, even a non-Orthodox Jew, without greeting them, they immediately think that it's because, I mean, we should greet each other also, but they immediately think that it's because we look down on them. And there are many, many people who told me many stories from this neighborhood. And people may come to them, you know, you're the first, you're the first Orthodox Jew to say hello to me in the last, you know, three days. Why do, they, why do they all look down on me? You know, one never knows. So that's a very important thing. But something else in terms of Chil Hashem is at its core, Chil Hashem is when one does something that detracts from other people's ability or inclination to serve God properly. And we have to realize that we can commit a Chil Hashem for ourselves also. It's sort of as akin to what we described before as making ourselves bare that when we commit certain sins, we create certain negative momentum for ourselves. Maybe we were doing something so positive, and then we kind of changed gears, and we stopped. And, and, and we can look back, sometimes we can look back, there was that moment, that was a turning point, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a negative way. That was a Chil Hashem for me. Just need to think about. Um, it's like, I, I just want to share one more, one more thought. It happens to be, if you're in the article sitter, it's the nun one, but it's 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 the second last line on page nine before. On the sins that were committed before you with interest. Hey, listen, this Torah prohibition to charge another Jew interest. Uh, it's distinctly possible. Maybe someone did that this year. It's distinctly possible. No one in this room did that. I mean, I don't know. Uh, we're not supposed to talk about it, you know. So, Desta uh, says, why is it that we're not allowed to charge another Jew interest? The reason we're not allowed to charge another Jew interest is because we have to view all of Klau Israel as being our brothers and sisters. And if we view all of Klau Israel as being our brothers and sisters, when there's another Jew that has a need and they need money, for us to charge them interest for the money is on some level cruelty. That we need to have some level of benefit in our, in our cherished one's time and need. So, Take it out of the literal meaning of interest for a moment. Have we acted in a cruel way this year? Have we acted in a cruel way to anyone, certainly any of our fellow Jews? Have we acted in a cruel way this year? It's another thing, meaning of the word. Um, just to think about, again, so forgive me for just the haphazard points, because which is some that, that I think are uniquely meaningful, at least to me. Uh, it's very important, if we're talking about truth, it's very important to always remember that if we try to make ourselves perfect this Yom Kippur, um, one thing we're sure of is that we'll fail miserably. Um, if we try to just be a little bit better this year, take one or two things, a positive thing, a negative thing, something that uh, we can actually do a little bit better, maybe not even completely better, maybe just improve on it and have a practical plan of reaction. That's a tremendous thing. It's a tremendous thing because we view victory as being a deepening of the relationship with God, as we've discussed over here tonight. So we're strengthening that bond, we're strengthening the sense of responsibility and connection. That, of course, is the case. But the vidui is an opportunity to really put it all on the table. People ask all the time, so we're fooling, so we'll come. What are you talking about? We come to God and we ask him to judge us favorably this year. Why? Because we're gonna we're gonna speak five minutes less of Russian heart this year, that's our grand plan. So like why are we saying all this vidui? So my personal outlook is Bidui is when we express what we want to be. 
our practical plan of action for Chuba is when we express the concrete small steps that we hope to undertake this year to get closer to where we want to be. We need both. We need the high aspirations for where we want to be, and we need the concrete plan to get a little bit further. If I don't have both of those, I'm terribly deficient in the Chuba process. But it's okay to put it on the table. Because again, we see this as part of our prayer relationship. So it's not a contradiction in terms of that. I just think it's a very worthwhile thing to think about. And um, we should all merit to have, we can allow the Bidui, like we said, the Kachli Machem Torah, take those words that we express, make a little more part of ourselves. Even if we're not going to change in all these ways this year. But at least it bothers me. At least I think about it. At least I can remember things that I did to that effect. If I can't remember anything that I did to that effect, so then how much did it bother me? <laughs> but this is our opportunity to express both ourselves and to God how we really hope to be greater people this year. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.